In the last chapter, we talked about what goes on in the outside world as far as the economy is concerned. Taxes, government spending, inflation, unemployment, national expenditure, all of these things will potentially have an impact on an organisation. What we're going to talk about in Chapter 11 is we're going to talk about things that affect the business perhaps in a bit more detail. The thing with the economy is inflation affects everybody. Unemployment affects everybody. What we're interested in Chapter 11 is we're interested more is what affects our company. And there may be things here that are particular to us that affect our business and don't affect other businesses. Now, you will see Chapter 10 and particularly Chapter 11 again when we come and talk about Paper P3, because these both come in again, and they're very important when we get to Paper P3. So the idea behind Chapter 10 and Chapter 11 is we must pay attention to what's going on in the outside world. Now, the good thing about Chapter 11 is there's really only a couple of ideas that we have in here. The first of them is what's called the business environment. And the business environment is talking about the environment is anything beyond the boundary of our organisation. That's a fancy way of saying what is going on outside our organisation which might affect it. Very, very simple. You can, do, you can look at this using what's called pest analysis. Again, it's a big thing, big thing when I see you for P3. We'll be talking about pest, or pest analysis. So pest analysis simply says, let's look at everything that's happening in the outside world and divide it into four categories. P, E, S and T, I will just tell you now, although we're going to see them again in a minute, political, economic, social, technological. Anything at all that happens in the outside world can be divided into one of those four boxes. And the reason we are interested in it in paper F1 is simply to say something has changed. That's all we're going to do. In paper P3, we will then start saying something has changed. Is it making it harder for us to run a business or is it making it easier for us to run a business? We're not really going to worry too much about that now, but just to warn you, that's what we're going to get later on. So, political, economic, social, technological. I'm not really going to worry very much about economic, because that was chapter 10. Inflation, unemployment, tax rates, interest rates, blah, 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 blah. That's the stuff we've already seen. I'm interested in the other three for now. Political. Is there anything that's going to change as far as the law is concerned, which is going to make our lives easier or difficult? Is it going to put our costs up, put our costs down? What's going to happen? So organisations need to consider things like legislation, changes in the law. So, for example, one of the things that has happened in the European Union over the last couple of years is what's it's to do with recycling. Now, if I buy a television, so there are various products that are in this kind of category. If I buy a television, one of the things that the company I buy it from, one of the things the shop is now supposed to do is to help me dispose of my old television. Now, the idea is that if they don't do this, then all that I would do is I'd throw my television away, and that means you end up with loads and loads of rubbish. So there are various products, refrigerators is another one, where if I go to a shop and buy a new refrigerator, they are supposed to help me take the old one away. Now, that, of course, means that there is a cost to them. That will affect their profit margins. And unfortunately, they have no choice about it. Some companies will pass the cost on to the consumer. I recently bought a washing machine and I got the old one taken away, but I had to pay to have it taken away. But in some industries, they aren't allowed to charge you. You have to, in effect, they have to just take that cost. So legislation could put your costs up. Regulation. Again, the various rules that you have to follow. We'll talk in a minute about health and safety. 
So there might be various procedures that you are forced to follow, which again will put your costs up. They might stop you from doing something in a particular way. So we need to be aware of what these things are. Obviously, we can't break the law. And saying, oh, we didn't know, unfortunately, is obviously not good enough. So the idea is we need to investigate what's going on and make sure that we don't break these rules. The trouble is we also have to think what's going to be the financial impact on us of following these rules. You can see these might impact the organisation at a number of different levels. Locally would mean our London office. There might be rules that are in force in London. Now, a local council, I don't know the equivalent wherever you are, but in the UK you get local councils that will look at things like what you are allowed to recycle and what you aren't allowed to recycle. So there are local rules. National rules would be for the UK. So there might be national policies that we have to follow. Globally would be somebody such as we've got an international, or an even better example, an MNC. If any of you have come across that, that's a multinational company. And the idea behind an MNC is it operates in a lot of different countries and therefore there are lots of different rules that they have to follow. It might be that they can work out a way that they can follow all of them by doing the same thing everywhere in the world. So they have a policy that means that if they follow the policy, they don't break any rules anywhere. On the other hand, they might have to have certain ways of doing things in one country and a different way in another country. Underneath that, one of the particular sets of rules that you are expected to know about in paper F1, health and safety regulations. Now, 100 years ago, there were virtually no health and safety regulations whatsoever, which meant that managers of a company could get workers to do things, and if the workers were injured, if the workers were killed, the managers just got on with things. The whole idea was that the workers didn't matter. If they were injured or killed, who cares as long as we make a profit? Various companies and countries and governments have decided that that is not acceptable. And so, therefore, there's going to be various rules that people have to follow. Now, obviously, this is not specific, what we've got in this particular page, because there will be different rules for different industries. Let's be honest, working as an accountant is not the most dangerous of industries, so there won't be many health and safety rules. Working down a coal mine or in a gold mine or on an oil platform, I think that's a lot different. So it will depend on the kind of situation that you get in the exam. But health and safety, the sort of things we're talking about are things like the working environment, making sure that the workplace is not dangerous or is made... Some workplaces just will be dangerous. A coal mine is a dangerous place, so making sure it's no more dangerous than it has to be. Making sure you've got the right equipment. It might include testing the equipment regularly to make sure it's not faulty and it's not going to damage things. Making sure people have been trained and investigating what happens when there's a problem. Companies will be forced to do these things. Now, it will cost money. You could argue it's probably a good idea that it costs money because then people will take it seriously. It's a good thing to spend the money on, but it still costs money. So we have to think about, um, employers have to think about making sure they don't break any of these rules. Employees must also think about the safety of others. Employees must also make sure that they follow these rules. If the company says, do it like this so that you are kept safe, and an employee breaks those rules and then gets injured, well, to a certain extent, that's the employee's fault. So one of the things that the company must do is tell all the workers what they are supposed to do, what the guidelines are. It says, as well as legal things, there are other reasons why we should take health and safety issues seriously. Ethical. Ethics is something you'll come across in P1. We should look after our staff simply because it's the right thing to do. It'd be very unfair to get staff and then treat them so badly they get injured. Motivation. 
Hertzberg, where would Hertzberg put that? Well, he'd obviously put it under the hygiene factors. If you went to a workplace which wasn't safe, I don't think you'd want to work very hard. Reputation. If you get a reputation as a company that doesn't treat its workers properly, you may well lose customers. You certainly won't get any good employees wanting to work for you. There could be damages, people suing you, there'd be a financial consequence, and all of those could end up with a loss of your business. So the idea is that we need to think about what rules we have to follow. That's the absolute minimum. We might decide, what that page is talking about, is we might decide to do even more than that. So we might decide to put extra procedures in place that we don't have to, but we choose to, to make our workers even safer. So the health and safety is one issue that I'm afraid you are expected to know about. Because if you are supervising some staff, you're expected to make sure you're not breaking any health and safety. The other thing that is in the syllabus talks about data protection, data security. As accountants, we come across a lot of confidential information about other people. We will come across information about customers and where they are located. We will come across information about suppliers and where they are located. We'll come across information about workers, how much they own, um, how much they earn, where do they live. There's a lot of information that we have and we need to be careful about it that we don't tell anybody that we're not supposed to. So data protection. Data protection means we have to make sure that this information is not misused. Now, we've got the various principles. First of all, we should acquire the information lawfully. So we can't get information illegally about people. We have to have to get it for a particular reason. It shouldn't be used for anything which is incompatible. Now, let's say, for example, you apply to me for some credit. You are a company, you want to buy something off me for some credit. I will find out something about you. Now that's completely understandable. I will find out some information about you because obviously I want to know should I give you some credit or not. That's absolutely fine. The problem would be when I found out that information, do I go around telling other people you are good to give credit to or you are bad to give credit to because that's going beyond what I got that information for. So I can only use it to help me make a decision, are you going to get any credit? After that, I can't use it for anything else. It should be relevant. It should not be excessive. The trouble is, I might collect more information than I actually need to help me make a decision on whether you get any credit. And of course, the more information I get, the more I know about you. Now, does that mean that I am perhaps knowing more than I should do about you? So, for example, one of the, I, I sometimes buy things on the internet. And when I buy things on the internet, it often comes up and it says, please fill out this form so we know about you as a customer. They are basically collecting information. One of the common lines that they have there is phone number. I always leave that blank because I don't see what business it is of theirs. They need to know my name, I understand that. They need to know my address because they need to know where to send things to. They need my email address because they may need to send me a copy of you know, what I've ordered. But I don't see that they need to know my phone number, so I don't bother putting it in. I would prefer it if they didn't bother asking for it. So do you have just the right amount of information and no more? Next time, if you do buy things on the internet, look at the kind of questions you're asked and see, do you actually, is this actually helping them at all? Because if it's not helping them, then I would just leave it blank, personally. But that's just me. Data should be accurate. You come to me and you say, I would like some credit. And I look up, I, I, go, I find out about you, and I find out that you are being taken to court because you've not paid a bill. Let's be honest, you don't get any credit from me. Now, maybe in two weeks' time, that court case gets settled. And in fact, it turned out that you were correct. So now I should update my records. Now you have got no problems with your credit. The only thing I could find wrong was the court case. The court case has gone in your favour. 
I should update my records and now I should give you some credit. So it's up to me to keep my records accurate and up to date. If things have changed, I have got to make sure my records are updated. Don't keep the data for longer than it's required. So in other words, if you've not bought anything from me for three or four years, maybe I should get rid of your records because obviously you're not buying anything. You can always apply again if you need to. And finally, we should try and make sure that the data is not lost. I might have a lot of information about my customers. Now, what happens if somebody else finds out? I suppose it depends what the product is. But imagine, for example, I had a list of customers. Remember, imagine, for example, I was a pharmaceuticals company and I had a list of individual customers who buy the tablets that I sell. That could be quite damaging to those customers if people found out. It certainly could be embarrassing to them. So it's up to me to try and make sure that I look after all that data. And in the UK, that is governed by various bits of legislation. Data security, same kind of idea. Once I have got data, once I've got information about you, it's up to me to make sure it is not physically damaged. In other words, somebody comes along and smashes up, breaks the computer that that information was stored on. Human damage. Somebody comes along and alters it. So on a computer disk somewhere is a record of my um, details. If I've bought something from a company, they have records of my details. They know where I live. What happens again if somebody comes along and steals it? Operational problems. What happens if, for example, somebody has typed the wrong name in? Somebody's typed the wrong address in? So every time I order something, it actually goes somewhere else. These are all the kind of things we need to check. We need to make sure that the data is kept correct and is not being accidentally damaged. Final one, corruption. Any of you that have ever had a problem with a computer disk where for some reason it decides to stop working, and I've had that happen a couple of times now, any of you that have ever had that happen will know how frustrating it is. You can't do anything. Data corruption is terrible because basically you can't run your business. So data protection is something that you have to do by law. Data security is something that's probably a very good idea for you to do to make sure that you don't suffer all these problems.